Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, we're live. Hey, we're live. So today on our show, by the way, hello, all you teachers, all you kids out there, principals, grandmothers, or whoever's out there, moms, dads, thanks for coming on our show. Today, we have a wonderful author. Uh, her name is uh, Cynthia Nushwanda. We'll just call her Cindy. And I know her because we share the same publisher. And um, she writes a lot of math books, you know? So I invited her to come on. Maybe you know some of her books. Uh, I, I teach her, I call her the circumference lady. So you'll see what I mean in a minute. So there you go. Um, so thank you for coming on, Cindy. And um, we're looking forward to meeting another wonderful children's author. So um, Cynthia, where are you right now? Hi, I'm, I'm actually on the central coast of California, probably halfway between San Francisco and Los Angeles in a small community called San Luis Obispo. And I've lived here about five years. And prior to that, I lived in the Bay Area. I was born in San Diego, so I've kind of lived all over the state of California, among lots wow. of other places as well. Uh, in the 90s, I used to go all over California visiting schools. Haven't done it that much lately, but I could give a tour of the state, you know? Good. Well, um, have you been to San Luis, Jerry? Yeah. yeah. Morro Bay, San Luis Obispo. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to think of the other towns up there. Um, I went kayaking in Morro Bay with my son. Um, so one of my neighbors uh, is Jim Lonborg, who pitched game one, three, and seven, I think, a one, five, and seven in the World Series in 1967. And he grew up in San Luis Obispo. Oh, How do you like that? What do you know? So <laughs> when, I, when I was out there, I was like, why, why would he leave? <laughs> oh, it's a beautiful place. Now, it's actually yeah. growing a he little now lives, He now lives on the East Coast. Okay. So um, I guess, so you're in California. By the way, everybody, I'm in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm in South Boston. If I turn my camera, the city's right over there. I live downtown. It's a beautiful um, city. I'm, beautiful city. I'm, I'm done with the suburbs. My kids are all grown up. Actually, I have a kid who lives in LA. Oh. So um, how did you, how could we start? Where did you grow? Oh, you grew up in San Diego. I did. My dad's in the Navy, and so we traveled a fair bit. I did live on the East Coast. We lived in uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and then we went out to Hawaii. So we kind of lived everywhere where there was water because he was in the Navy. So yeah. then even when I grew up, I've actually lived abroad quite a bit. I've lived in Austria, Germany, Switzerland, and this was all England. This was all part of being in the Navy. No, uh, when I was when I no, when I grew up, my husband worked in international finance, so we moved around the world. And uh, so actually if you see right here, I'm wearing a I love it. A metal breastplate. It's an actual authentic piece of armor. It's 17th century Flemish. And when we lived in England back in the late or mid, no, early 90s, um, I, that's when I got the idea for writing some of my books, the circumference books. And um, I actually really liked the medieval times and armor and all those kinds of things. So we were actually in a, in a town where they sold armor, real armor. And I said to my husband, hey, I'd like to buy some. And he said, well, sure. So I, I bought this breastplate. It actually has a little a dent on this side over here because it's been musket ball proofed. So whoever was going to use this would, would be assured that, okay, this, um, this is going to protect me. And uh, I don't know, I liked looking at castles when we lived over there. And I just liked armor. And it sort of helped me to kind of imagine my first book, which was the circumference book. So I'm going to take this armor off now because it's 12 pounds of it, and I don't really want to be here with 12 pounds of armor. But I have other things like here's my sword. It's not real, but um, I bought it when I lived in Germany, um, and it's kind of reminds me of circumference and those kinds of things. So the other thing. Now, that did you ever did you ever put on a full body of armor? <laughs> no, I didn't. But the funny thing was, is we went to the Tower of London when we lived in the London area. And I visited there, it has lots of armor. And it was lovely to see uh, Henry VIII's armor because they showed his armor when he was a, a slender, young, strapping king. And then it showed yeah. his other suit of armor when he was kind of an old toad of a king. And the, the girth expanded quite a bit. It was very, 
really, really interesting. But another place wow. that we went when, when we lived in England was Winchester Castle. And that's where the actual real round table, um, it, that's where it is. And it's no longer a table, it hangs on a wall now. And it was done about the year 1250. So it's King Arthur and his round table, but King Arthur, if he ever lived, was about the sixth century. So this is about 600 years too late. But nevertheless, it was a round table that was used for meetings and it's 18 feet in diameter. Um, and so I'm gonna, sh I, I actually loved it so much. I bought a, I bought a- um, Replica? Yeah, it's a cutting board actually, it's a breadboard. But I don't use it to cut on because then it would kind of you know, ruin it. But um, this particular table dates somewhere between 1250 and 1350 AD, which is right around the so time- that was the day. actual writing that was on the table? Um, yeah, Be, well, actually, the, the table wasn't painted until about the 1520-ish, 1516. Um, and that particular table, when it was first used, they know it was used because it had little um, places on the underside where legs used to go. But um, it's just hung on a wall now. When I went over to see it, I thought, oh, wow, look at that. That's King Arthur. But actually, this, um, this portrait here is the young yeah. king, it's really the young King Henry VIII. So I guess he was quite enamored with himself and sort of imagined himself as, as Arthur, if you will. And so when I saw that, I thought, oh, well, I've, has, I've been steeped in all this stuff of castles and armor. And I thought, oh, this is gonna be kind of fun. I'm gonna write this book. But the reason I wrote the book was because um, I actually had been working in an international school in Germany, in Frankfurt, and I ran across this marvelous teacher who shared with me the idea of teaching children um, mathematics through stories. Now, I am a teacher. I've been teaching since the mid-70s. That's what I do. I'm a teacher who writes on the side. I'm not- So a when you got out of college, you started teaching? I did. Is that what you yeah. yeah. I have to tell you, when I was a kid, the two things I hated most were writing and math. Hated them. <laughs> Absolutely couldn't stand either one of them. And so you never thought of being a writer when you were a kid. Oh, so what I tell my students is, hey, you don't know who you're going to be when you grow up. So just embrace and learn everything you can because you might do like I did and shock yourself. I'm totally shocked yeah. that at this point in my life, I love math and I love writing. And the thing I hated most as a kid was the rewriting. I just thought that was dreadful. I mean, once you write something, you're done. And now I love the rewriting. So you just don't know who you're going to be when you grow up. Yeah. So at any rate, I, I went to this, I taught at this school in Germany and met this woman. And she told me how she thought back in the, like 1990, how kids can learn math through writing. And I thought, well, that sounds cool. I hated math. Maybe this will be a, w a way to help kids like me to learn how to like math better. So that's how I started. And so then I, I, I lived in Europe for four years and we moved back to the United States. I'd written this story in England. It's this story here, actually. Circumference in the first round table. Yeah. A mass that's, adventure. That's the one I first wrote. And I wrote it when I was living in England. And I thought, oh, that's a pretty good idea. Mm, I don't think the writing is so great. So I came back to the United States. I started teaching again. The book was on my shelf. But I, I kind of remembered it. And then I saw this class through UC Berkeley Extension, writing children's picture books. I'm like, yes, this is for me. This will help me. So I went and learned how to do it. And the rest yeah. is history. Now, when you did that, did they say the books were 32 pages long? Oh, yeah. They told you all about how it all, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, had you written like a 48-page book or a 16-page book? Like, what had you written at the time? Oh, it was probably about... 1500 words maximum so of course it had to be you know smaller you know shorter but i think the problem with it was it's, it wasn't that well written now i'm a teacher i read tons of kids books and so i knew mm, i don't think this is really well written so after i learned how then wow okay it was good yeah so i've written that's 17 great. books now i write about math because i love math and that seems to be my niche my older son told me for once in my life i was in the right place at the right time so I was there at the beginning, kind of at the birth of math literature, and, and I love writing about it, so I do. So I have a new yeah. book, I mean, I'd like to share a 17 little bit about books. That. 17 books, wow. Mm -hmm. uh, show us as many covers as you can. Show okay. like the teachers, the kids, so. This is Mummy Math. Yeah. Oh this yeah, is, Mummy Math. This is the first in a series by Henry Holt. 
And I have traveled to Egypt, so I can imagine being in the pyramids. And this one's- Now that illustrator, Brian, whatever his name was. Lando, uh, yeah. Do you know him? No, I don't know any of my illustrators actually. Where does he live? Do you know where he lives? Uh-huh, he lives in no. New Jersey. Oh yeah? I Patterns guess in Peru, Adventures in Patterning. I think all you creative people must live on the East Coast. That must be what it is. <laughs> Pastry school in Paris and adventure in capacity. Wow. And I, had I to don't go, know that one. I had to I go. I don't know that one. You don't know that one? No. I had, to, I had to go to a cooking school, a cooking academy in San Francisco to see how a cooking school works because that was in the story. And so I yeah. said to my husband, oh, I'm going to go. I have to go early in the day and you stay all day and I'm going to do it for two full days. He said, oh, that's great. So I get ready to go. I'm going to take the train into the city uh, and I pack a lunch. And my husband says, so why are you doing that? And I said, well, I'm going to be there all day. And he said, Cindy, you're going to a cooking school. There will be food there. I said, well, I'm not really sure. So I, I took yeah. my lunch anyway. And I'm in the very first session. It's like eight in the morning and somebody bursts through the door. You must try my coffee cake. And so everybody stops what they're learning and they eat. And then all we did was eat. So I didn't need a lunch, but it was really interesting. Wow. I learned how a cooking school worked, which I needed for that book. And they had said, well, we never had an author come and watch here. And I said, well, I really would love to learn how it works because I can't write the book unless I know what a cooking school is like. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So let's go back, Cindy, let's go back for a, a couple minutes. Your first book, Circumference. Well, yeah. it was actually, there were two first books, Jerry. There was this one, Circumference, and this one came out at the very same time, Amanda Bean's Amazing Dream. And, all right, but the Circumference book, mm -hmm. what is that about? This is about circles. Um, well, because there's a round table, but in my story... Um, they were trying to figure out the right kind of table for the king, but they didn't start with a round table. They had a rectangular one and a square one and a parallelogram one and nothing worked. There always was a problem with it, an oval one. Right. And finally, Very clever. So kids learn all the different shapes. Yeah. And then they figure out, okay, at the end, they're going to figure out, oh, all right, it's the round table that's going to be most equitable for all the knights. And Circumference has a, a wife named Lady Di of Amateur. She comes from the city of Amateur, Lady Di of Amateur. And she was the one who figured out how tall the table should be. It was cut from a cross section of a piece of, of, a, of a tree. And then Lady Di and Circumference have a son and his name is Radius and Radius is half as high as his mother. So it helps kids to understand because otherwise you're thinking Circumference, Radius and, and Diameter. Okay, those are three words. What do they mean? Yeah. In a textbook, yeah. it's just a little drawing. And yeah. it's like with my third graders, they can't remember area and perimeter, which is the inside and what's the outside, because they don't have anything to hold on to. So the story helps you to do that. Wow. Very clever. Very clever. And um, yeah. what was I going to ask you? Well, keep going. Well, the other way, so, thing that, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. No, you go. I'm sorry. Circumference for me, when I was a child, maybe at 10 or 11 or 12, somewhere in there, um, yeah. that was a mnemonic I actually invented on my own. Oh, it's not, it's not certainly my own original idea. Bill Pete, who used to do uh, Disney movies and then wrote many books on his own. My son told me the other day, mom, hate to burst your bubble, but Bill Pete thought of the idea of circumference in the 1930s and it's in some little movie he made. I was like, well, okay. Yeah. Bill, Bill yeah. Pete and I can share that idea along with other people. When I was a kid, I said, okay, circumference reminds me in my head of a knight standing around a round table. That's how I remembered the idea that it's the outside edge of a circle. It was just helpful for me. That's how I learned math. The reason I hate yeah. math is not because I'm not good at it. It's because nobody taught me in a way that I could actually understand. And finally, yeah. you know, I'm yeah. hopefully helping some kids on, you know, as well. The, the books have been out for over 20 years, so um, they're getting new covers now. They're all going to be redesigned and looking like this one. This is the second All right, so book. this is Circumference and the Dragon of Pi. Yeah, this is all the right. second book, right? I, I wrote yeah. the first book, and, and then... How many Circumference books are there? Um, I'm Number 11 will come out in October of 2020, so... Yeah. It's great. It's great to see them all lined up. They look great. 
Yeah, it's kind of like Harry Potter. Well, I don't remember the titles, just there are a bunch of them. But I see your books. I see them. I go to a lot of schools. I see them all the time. Good. So That's good to hear. You did, a, you did a good job. Yeah. Well, your books are around too, and I use them in my classroom, Jerry. So it's mutual. Well, just to change the subject for a, a second, I started writing math books, but I was doing candy. Look, there's count by fives. Yeah. You know, and there's uh, an addition book. An addition book. I like your fraction it. one. Where's your fraction yeah. one? Yeah. That's yeah, the one I always fraction. loved using with my kids in third grade. We did that one all the time. That was a good one. I know, but I'm I can't print those anymore. Not to. No, but but yeah. those of us who still have copies use them, Jerry. We do. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, isn't it interesting? Around the same time, we started writing math books. You were probably like me. I looked around and there were no picture children's math books. No, no. It was, in fact, it this, wasn't. this one teacher that helped me in Germany and shared this idea of reading math stories to kids, I thought, oh, this is awesome. I'm going to go back to the United States that next summer on my home leave and I'm going to buy a bunch of these. Well, there weren't any. So naively, I said, well, maybe I can write one. And that's how I started. Yeah. That's how I started. Right. I'm a teacher. I'm a full-time teacher. I actually don't write full I don't work full-time right now. I work part-time. But that's what I do. So I'm when you teacher. first started teaching, what grade were you doing? Actually, believe it or not, I started out in high school. And I was really, doing, you were a high school teacher. Right? I was doing German, and I was doing social studies, and I did uh, yearbook journalism, and I coached track and field and and uh cross country and i said and then oh, I, i'm learning uh, i'm learning all this great stuff about you i never knew and then after yeah. a, a few years of that i had uh, some kids and i said you know i'm gonna stay home with them for a couple of years and and i love the little kids so much i said hey when i go back i'm gonna go back in the elementary and i did and i never looked back i never regretted that so back in the yeah. oh probably then in the later 80s i went back as yeah. a elementary school teacher and been doing it ever since. I think it's yeah. I, it's a hoot, and I like being a teacher and a writer because I'm really closely connected to the kids. I do some school visits like you do, and I do conferences, yeah. but I don't do a ton of them because it'll pull me out of the classroom. But every day yeah. I go and I see kids, and I see what they read, and I see what their senses of humor are, and I see what they like to do, and right. what they're confused by. So it's a, it, it helps me as a writer to work with them, and I love doing it. Yeah. Someone said to me one day, we have, we have those of us that go to schools or teach in schools, we have unfair advantage because we're getting constant, you know, information from the kids. Oh yeah. They're telling us what they like to read, or they're telling us, or the teachers tell us what's missing out in the classroom that they'd like to have, you know. So um, I figured that out too because I teach math, and I went to a conference in 2010 in in Wisconsin in Green Lakes. It was their state math conference and I said to the organizer, well, why'd you invite me? And she said, because you're one of us. It's like, okay, <laughs> I, am, I am one of you. And they yeah. really, they like the fact that I'm a teacher because yeah, I get it. And I know what needs to be done. Not everything, obviously, but I'll say, hey, I'm gonna write a book on this or that. And I try to do topics that may not be broadly covered or I try to do a yeah. topic in a different way. Yeah. So is there a subject you wanted to do? Because I, I have one. Is there a subject you wanted to do in math that they wouldn't let you do? Or the publisher or the editor wouldn't oh, I keep wanting to write a book on like beginning algebra and they're all like, well. That's, real, that's really funny you say that because that's what I said. I wanted to write an algebra book. I've got a great yeah. circumference story on algebra and they're like, no. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, just to compare notes, did you do a percentage book? Um, my next one is a percentage book, and it's um, that one's supposed to be 2022. Um, yeah, I, I haven't I haven't heard because you just wrapped up the book on decimals. I sort of a three for my two, the last book I did. Oh, you was, did a decimal book. Yeah. I did fractions. The one I would like to read a little bit today is decimals, but it's different because it's decimal place value, which there's not a lot out there on that one. And then the yeah. third one in that trike was going to be percentage, and I have a little story already kind of shaped up a bit on that one yeah oh that's great and then after yeah. that doggone it i want to do the algebra book <laughs> but, oh, to wait uh, i think you should do it 
I'm encouraging you to do it. How's yeah, that? but it's not just that. You have to have the publisher say, sure, we'll print it for you. Because if they don't, yes. what's the use? I mean, yeah, it's yeah. there. I, I've ha actually had teachers say, why don't you write an algebra book? You know, but well, I'm not going to do it. So you do it. Okay. Well, I mean, I go to different conferences like you do, and I sign books like you do, and I talk to the teachers, and I always say to them, hey, you know, what grade do you teach? And I have, at every conference, I have a bunch of teachers, not tons, but I'll have some that will sheepishly say, um, I teach AP Calculus. And I said, you teach AP Calculus, and you're buying my books? And they say, well, even big kids like a good story every now and again. So I wrote one book. I'm going to show you the title of it here. Yeah. This one's called Circumference and the Isle of Imeter. And this yeah. is about um, this is about the idea of perimeter and area. It starts easy with squares and rectangular uh, rectangles and then other irregular shapes, but then it moves to the circle. So it's the area of the circle is the end of the book. And I decided after I'd gotten these com these comments from all these high school teachers that I would just squeeze a tad of beginning calculus into that book which I did do. And I said yeah. to teachers after that, this was for you. Just a little tad, because what can happen with my books is you can springboard up into a more complicated idea, or you can yeah. go diving down, say, into a simpler idea. They have a good span. And it's sort of books that can be used even up until middle and high school a little bit, which lots of picture books can't. So that's something that's kind of special, I think, about that series that we discovered at Charles Bridge, the publisher, after we started using them or people started using them that a lot of middle yeah. school teachers are using them. Yeah. Hey, I had a high school kid say to me, he never, that she never understood the whole concept of fractions until she saw the Hershey bar book. Yeah. And I thought, wow, a high school kid. Yeah. But I, I know what they mean. Like all of a sudden you visualize the whole thing, you know? And I think part of the problem is say with the idea of pie. Yeah. Um, everybody knows that it's 3.14159 and it goes on for an infinite number of places and that you yeah. use that pi r squared to figure out the, the, uh, the area of a circle. But no one yeah. ever tells you what pi is. They don't, they don't, they just tell you it's a number and they give you this, yeah. the Greek 16th letter of the alphabet symbol, but they don't tell you yeah. what it is. Now that's the part that was missing for me as a student of math. I like to know why and what before I know how. And all in American mathematics, we want to tell, this is how you do it. This is how you do it. But what is it? You got to know first what it is before you know, you know, how to apply it, I think. Yeah. By the way, you're reminding me of, I was at a school before the quarantine, when we all had to go indoors, I had done a week of schools and I was at a school somewhere and all the kids had pie on their face. Oh, was it pie day? Well, three points. Pie three, day. Uh, yeah, yeah, March 14th, you were there? It must have been March 14th, yeah. <laughs> so I walk in and they all have pie on their face and I started laughing because I <laughs> got it, but I had never seen that before. Yeah, Pi Day has been around for a while now. And uh, quite a number of years ago, after I think I had written, maybe in the early 2000s, um, after I'd written the first couple books, um, my husband and I are sitting in the living room reading quietly in the evening and he's reading the Wall Street Journal and he starts to just kind of choke up and he says, Cindy, you've got to read this. And he passes me the newspaper. I'm thinking, well, okay. And it was a whole article about Pi Day and my book was referenced in there. And here's my husband, you know, we're sitting here in California and they're referencing my book in the Wall Street Journal. I thought, well, you never know where wow. it's going to pop up. Yeah. That's, and he's just reading a lot. Good. Yeah. All right. Here's some. Here's some. Uh, Susan Hutchins from Colorado says, "Does your um, shield? What do you call that plate? Oh, my breastplate. The armor. Does your breastplate offer virus protection? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish. Not really, but. So Lynette Richaud says, "I need these math books." Oh, uh, good. Thanks, Lynette. There They're fun. There you go. Um, I love having you on because I think your books are great. And I think all teachers, all classrooms should have them. And then I, uh, I, I think a lot uh, of them do a lot of homeschooling. People use those yeah. books as well. Um, and From Canada, good. Linda Edwards says, <laughs> best place to get writing ideas, ask teachers. They know what is missing. Right. And, and I am a teacher. I know what's missing. I'm in there. And a lot of them. Um, yeah. 
a lot of teachers will say if they don't know my background, they'll say, how, how did you know this would work so well in the classroom? Now, they're not classroom lessons that I've put into a book, but I'm there every day. I know this stuff. I know yeah. all the standards and I know what everybody's using because I'm there. Yeah. In fact, it's really funny that the, the, the math um, series that the school I'm in now, it's called Bridges. And they, in the fourth grade, they use a circumference in the great Knight of Angleland. And every year now I go in on the day the teacher's supposed to read that book and I read that book. So they get an author read every year. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it's fun. Show us some more titles. Now, right. did you write any books that weren't math books? Um, not that are published. I've written some, but not that are published. Here's a really fun, <clears throat> fun one that I wrote. 88 pounds of tomatoes. Mm -hmm. It's a Hello Math reader book. So it's kind of like yeah. kids would read on their own. And it was a really funny story how I thought of the idea. Scholastic asked me, would I write a story on subtraction? I said, oh, sure. And I'm kind of thinking, what do I want to do? And then I find, I go to visit my mom and dad and there's this gardening catalog on my dad's table. And it's about, uh, on the cover is some tomato plant that'll apparently grow 350 pounds of tomatoes. And I said, well, that's interesting. And, and I said, what would you do with that many tomatoes? And my dad's like, oh man, you could can them. You could make chili sauce. You could do this and that. And my mom's like, yeah. if you want a can of tomatoes, we'll just go to the market and buy one. And I said, well, who would be silly enough to buy a plant like that? My dad said, um, I actually bought that plant. So it's in this huge pot in the backyard. And yeah. my mother's not looking forward to the harvest. My father is. So, I mean, I finish my visit. I go home. I take the catalog with me because now I have an idea. We're going to have a plant that grows 88 pounds of tomatoes, kind of the same idea. Uh, I and, may have missed it. Was there some reason you picked 88? Um, I needed a number that was smaller. It didn't need to be two digit because this is for like first and second grade kids. So subtraction oh, smaller numbers there. Yeah. Uh, and then, so I called my parents later on while I'm writing the book. Hey, how's the tomato plant? <laughs> my mom's like, well, it died. My dad said, yeah. <laughs> We didn't water it. So my dad was a real good conceptual gardener. He just <laughs> didn't get in there real well and do the practical work like watering the plant. So we never knew how many tomatoes that one would actually yield. But in my book, all 88 yeah. pounds, they did grow. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. And then I did this one as well. This is a little book um, on money and it's called Chocolate, Chocolate Champs. Champs. Yeah, those are both through Scholastic. And then let's see. Then, oh, that's great. I mean, I showed you all the mummy map patterns in Peru pastry school. The, the rest are all circumference books, but I can show you my newest one when you, wherever you want me to share a bit of that. But You can share it. Go ahead. Okay. Now, a month ago, Jerry and everybody else out yeah. there, Cindy did not know even what Zoom was. So I think I'm going to do this well. Let's see. Okay. So fast. Whoa, there you go. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to read part of this book, but I'm going to make it a teaser. Do you know, like in the old days in a newspaper, you'd have serials of stories and they would come and every week you would read the next one until, you know, you found the whole story out. Well, I'm going to read part of the story and then anybody who's interested can find out the ending in October. So hey, can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. You like the new covers? I do. Do you? Good. When this I first did when I, I first did my books in the early '90s, I guess, and that was before Apple computers, before uh, you know, Illustrator and all that sort of stuff, and millions of different types of fonts. And then uh, my book started to look really old, so we redid all the covers. So I, I did Charles that, yeah, I Charles did that about, 10 years, about 10 years ago, redid all the covers. Charles Bridges well, decided the same thing, yeah. Yeah, was that your idea or their idea? That was their idea. They just said, oh, Cindy, um, we're thinking of changing the covers. What do you think? And, I, and this is actually the title page of this one. I don't have the cover. I said, I love them. They look very Arthur Rackham-like kind of. Mm, yeah. fairy tale like a little bit if you will yeah. i really like yeah. the way they did that so i'm going to read a little bit of this one oh, that's good so here i go this is a math adventure circumference gets decimus point 
by Cindy Neuschwander, illustrated by Wayne Gehan, and permission to read by Charles Bridge. So let me get it down so it's small enough we can see. It's a double page spread here. Let's see. Okay. Can, can you see it okay? Yeah. Yeah, wait a minute. There we go. Now I can see both pages at once. This is the PDF I just got, it's like hot off the press. And I'm gonna tell you one reason I'm not gonna read the whole book is because every year when I have a new book come out, I say to the kids in my school, I'm gonna come and I'm gonna read it to some class, whatever it's appropriate for mathematically. And you yeah. kids will be the first children in the entire world, the first class in the entire world to hear the book. And so they really like that. So I, I can't- so I can be the I can be the first bald guy yeah. <laughs> no, my husband's First already bald read guy. bald. You can be the second oh. bald guy, Jerry. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, here we go. It's nearly sunrise, said Bart Graff, the baker, stoking the oven. His business partner, Pia of Chart, yawned. Oh, let's bake creme de la creme today. Creak, crash. Before Pia could finish her sentence, a large, hairy beast wrenched open the bakery door, stepped inside, and grabbed her. I am Tent the Ogre, boomed the creature, and I am borrowing this baker. Together they disappeared into the weak light of dawn. Bert was greatly shaken. He sprinted up to the castle and informed Circumference and Lady Di. Pia? Gone? Where? asked Circumference incredulously. We must search for her immediately, exclaimed Lady Di. I might have an idea how to find her, Bert said. We'll follow the trail of fluff from the ogre's tunic. Meanwhile, Pia stood inside a manor house deep in the back country. Twelve huge ogres surrounded her. What do you want? She asked. The smallest ogre replied, I'm Decima. Here are my parents, Tent and Hundret, and my nine older sisters. Tonight we're celebrating our hundredth jubilee as gatekeepers of the bridge over the River Thames. We're preparing a feast, but we need help. Pia relaxed. Cooking I can do, she said. Point me to the kitchen. The place was in shambles. After tidying up, Pia assigned jobs to the ogres. Decima, you and I will make the dessert. Soon the kitchen was a sizzling, simmering cloud of delicious aromas. Pia and Decima mixed 10 batches of creme de la creme and poured them into immense square baking pans. When the first pans were cooling on the windowsill, Decima's oldest sister gobbled one down entirely. Heavenly, she declared. Una, cried Decima, you ate one whole batch. Tent was close behind. Such an ambrosial, ambrosial smell. May we share another? Here, Father, Decima cut a second batch into 10 equal portions. I've named this size piece a tent after you. Thank you, my little sugar plum, he said. Decima gave the pieces to her two parents and eight other sisters. After Hundred had eaten her slice, she said, Oh, Decima, this is toothsome. Could we have some more to nibble on while we mash and mix our meal? Decima took a third tin and cut it into ten tent-sized pieces. She cut each of these ten pieces into ten smaller equal squares. Here are one hundred hundred-sized morsels named for you, she said, hugging her mother. Oh, what a thoughtful daughter, exclaimed Hundred. Desma and Pia baked more dessert to replace what the ogres had eaten. Soon they had 10 pans of delicious creme de la creme. Psst, Pia, came a low voice from outside the kitchen window. Surprised, Pia and the ogres looked up from their work. Intruders, bellowed Tent, rushing toward them. These are my friends, called Pia. Let's ask them to lend a hand. Enter, he roared joyfully. So circumference Lady Di and Bart, assured that Pia was unharmed, climbed in and got to work. By late afternoon, all was ready. The ogre family changed into formal wear and joined their guests for the meal, while Pia and, and her team readied the desserts. How much on each plate, asked Lady Di. I'm using Decima's system, slicing each whole pan into tent-sized pieces, answered Pia. Lady Di looked confused. Tents are 10 equal parts in a whole pan, the baker explained. Whomp, Jessica, Decima burst through the kitchen door. Everyone wants dessert. We need 85 pieces now. 
delicious, delicious, raved the ogres, drumming their spoons on the dining tables. Good thing we have 10 batches, said Lady Di. That's 100 servings. Decimal looked worried. Hmm, we should have more pieces on hand for eager eaters. Then I shall cut one pan into hundreds, Pia decided. Better hurry, answered Circumference. They're going ogre the top. Will this be enough, Lady Di asked. Nine pans of tents is nine times 10 or 90 pieces, figured Bart. Plus 100 smaller slices in the hundreds pan, piped up Lady Di. That's 190 portions, said Pia happily. With 85 ogres, ogres to serve, there's more than enough for everyone to have a bigger first piece and a smaller second helping. Bart peered out through the kitchen doors. Uh-oh, uninvited guests have just landed in the rafters, he announced. Decima peeked out too. Oh, it's Towsender and his passel of 999 pesky pixies. They're sure to want dessert as well. Oh, we won't have enough unless the pixie helpings are smaller than hundreds, Decima reasoned. She took the hundreds pan and began to slice each of those 100 pieces into 10 very tiny but equal slivers. Little thousander sized bits, she said, smiling. A thousand servings from one pan? That's hardly more than crumbs, said Pia. Decima shrugged. Pixies are very small. Frenzied fists started pounding on the dining room side of the sturdy kitchen doors. Ignoring the ogre's antics, Lady Di said, hmm, I'm seeing a pattern to Decima's system. Every time we cut this dessert, we make it into pieces that are 10 times smaller. A tent is 10 times smaller than one hole. Bart nodded. A hundred is 10 times smaller than one tent. And a thousander is 10 times smaller than a hundred, exclaimed Circumference. Crack! The door exploded into splinters and a wave of ogres flooded the kitchen while the pixies cheered from the rafters. In the melee, a good deal of creme de la creme was flung across the room. Stunned, the ogres began to cry. Sweet treats were so important. Decima scolded them, see what you've done. Go sit in the dining room. We'll count what's left and share it among you. Ooh, if you wanna know what happens, get the book. We're done. That's it for today on sharing the story. That was terrific. Thanks. Great. So, so at the end of the book, do you have decimal points? Of course we do. It's called a radix point. Now you have to remember oh, uh, what happens point. next in the story is they have to record how many are left over after oh, the I see. food fight. And Bart and you... records it with a quill pen, which is very poorly cut. So it blobs. And so he wants to write as little as possible. So he writes the number of pans, like one, and he doesn't write pan because the pen's so poor. He just writes a little P, a blobby P. And then how many pieces after the one pan and say one piece or 10, whatever it is. And yeah. so then what happens is over time when they use the system, that little blobby P becomes either a point or a comma, because in Europe, we know that they don't use a point for the decimal, they use a comma. So the book is useful worldwide, whichever system you wow. use. Wow, I never knew that. Yeah, it's called a radix point, but it actually is expressed, if you were to go to Germany and look, say at their money system and say one comma five, one euro five, whatever they have. I see. That used to be Deutschmarks when I lived there, it'd be one Deutschmark five, 50 pfennigs kind of a thing. Yeah, but at least it makes it, um, so if you lived in Australia or England or Europe, you wouldn't have to read the book and say, well, we don't use a point here, we use a comma. This book allows yes. you to go either way. International. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Nice. yeah, so that's it. Hey, thanks for letting me give everybody a sneak peek on that book. Coming out on, um, actually it's coming out on my birthday, October 27th, 2020. They didn't yeah, know it was coming up. Yeah, they didn't know it was my birthday. Tell, but yeah. Tell us the name of it again. Oh, uh, oh it's circumference in the decimal. Yes, decimus point. Now it's the first um, it's the first book in the title that doesn't say circumference and. And we kind of struggled with the title a little bit. And I liked my husband kind of had the idea getting the point of something means you know you're understanding it. So I wanted to use that word play there because my books are full of actually really horrible puns that are so bad they're yes. <laughs> I, saw, I saw a few good ones in there. 
Yeah. Here, here we, we have one. We have another comment. Um, well, Linda Edwards says, loved it. Bravo. So Thanks, Linda. Thank you. Thanks Susan, so much. Susan from Colorado says, Cindy is what I call a wow teacher. So there you go. You're a wow teacher because she goes that extra mile for her students. Thanks, Susan. So there you go. That's really good. Well, that's what you do as a teacher. You never went into that career to, to become monetarily wealthy, but you're certainly wealthy in the heart from all the kids you work with. And I work with a great diverse group of kids. I work with kids who are homeless and, you know, kids who are in foster care. And, you know, I just work with a whole different range of children and my heart just goes out to them. I love them all. And, you know, they yeah. serve control of their circumstances, but you know what? I can make their school experience the best I can. And that's so important because some of them have, lack so much stability outside of school that school is a lovely place for them. So, yeah. 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 I know. I feel so bad for them not being in school right now. I mean, obviously we feel bad for ourselves, but I really feel bad for all those kids that look towards school, you know, as a, uh, a great home to go to, you know? Yeah, um, well, well I lost my train of thought, but. Can you think of anything else? Oh, um, well, I'm always writing. I, was good. Um, I actually yeah. also teach writing at, at Cal Poly. I teach because, um, you know, somebody taught me how to write picture books a long time ago. So I have these classes through Cal Poly, our local university here on writing children's picture books. So I, I work with those students as well and helping them to learn how to write picture books and, and hopefully um, you know, submit them and get them published as well. So I'm always writing, I'm teaching writing, I'm teaching kids, I teach Sunday school. I think all I do is live to teach because I really like doing it. And um, so I'm actually, I've just finished that rough draft of the percentage book for, for circumference and I'm writing, I'm doing something just for fun. I don't know if it'll ever get published, but I'm writing um, some middle grade chapter books. And I've written, I'm almost done with my second one and it's a series about these two shelter dogs who are just completely unadoptable, but they are actually picked up by a young woman who has a business uh, for sniff detectives. And sniff detectives are actually in the news right now because they're training dogs yeah. for COVID-19. So I think the yeah. books are rather timely. And the first book is how they got out of the shelter and then they became sniff detectives and were trained and then they found a stolen piece of art and the second book is about how, because they're these famous sniff detectives, they have um, a bounty on them and they have to run away and try to get escape the people who are, who are trying to actually wreck their noses. So I'm having fun with that when I'm not writing my picture books, but actually I have to just say I'm pretty much a math picture book author. Um, yeah. Um, here's a question here. Do you read your manuscripts to your students before sending them to an editor? Um, actually, no, I don't but I do share with my kids when sketches will come back or as they see the book unfolding in production. And so they'll often hear it before it's actually finished. And that's with my small groups, but I don't read the whole book until I have a full class. So I can say, you're the first class in the world to hear the book. And then the kids in my group, cause it's, um, it's, it's remediation, it's intervention math. They kind of sit there proudly like, yeah, yeah, that's our teacher. Yeah, we kind of already heard that book, but they don't, the whole huge group doesn't hear it and, until it's completely done. Now, did you write any counting books? Um, no, I haven't written I'm any all, counting I'm books. only laughing because my fellow authors make fun of me because I wrote a book that goes one, two, three, four, five, you know? <laughs> I'm writing a series right now. It doesn't have a publisher yet, but I'm writing a series of numerical tall tales. And um, the first one is a story where numbers kind of evaporate and then they rain back down again. There's a kind of a weird weather storm. And it is a counting book in some ways for the youngest readers because what would happen is the illustrations would show lots of ones and twos and threes floating away. And they're yeah. leaving all of their, their numerical homes, like uh, speed limit signs and prices and recipes, all the places we have numbers. And, yeah. and so kids could identify, oh, I see a one, there's a two, there's a three. So in a sense, it's a counting book, doesn't have a home yet. But no, I've never done a real simple counting book. Actually, I think my math stories are, they tend to be more on the, on the more complicated side. So they're really for maybe kids. Yeah. 
Um, I'm almost ashamed to say I write math books because I, I was I was thinking about it. What what would I dare show? Like this one counts by ones. That's right? we need to count by ones. There's nothing but wrong. This with one that. counts by odd numbers. And that's good. And this one counts even numbers. So I think of those as my math books. But but you know there's I nothing wrong with that. Because then we can jump, we can springboard up, Jerry, into least common multiple, where what you're doing is you're skip counting by different numbers. So if you've got your book down, counting by ones and twos, you've already on the road to finding least common multiple. So you can actually add and subtract fractions. See how you're contributing? It's good. So uh, I have a question. Do, have you thought of doing a book of prime numbers? Um, yeah, I kind of toyed Remember with that it. Remember that movie where... It, it, with it's a fictional of account how of how aliens first contact Earth, and they contact Earth by it's the book Contact. Okay. I think it's uh, I'm trying to think. Did Mishnah write that? Well, no, no, no. Maybe no. Oh, I know who it was. It was uh, Carl Sagan, and the aliens contact Earth by firing prime numbers at Earth. Oh, it's cool. Eventually, the eventually the astronomers pick up the fact that. Hey, look at these pulses are all prime numbers. You know? there's, there's some fascinating patterns with prime numbers that would make a really cool book, but I haven't, I haven't done anything with that, but it's certainly a, an yeah. interesting topic. But there's always Bean 13. That's a marvelous, marvelous book on prime numbers. So, you know, that's my yeah. good book on primes right now. But, but you Marie, know, that, that one Marie from cool. Oregon says you should self publish your algebra book. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Self-publishing, you know, I don't want to do all that work. I just want to write. Let somebody else draw it, market it, produce yeah. it, edit yeah. it, blah, 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 blah. Because I just like to do the one part of it. You know, I, I don't, yeah. I'm not that good on the rest of it. So, yeah. And what do you call a lot of sheep standing in a circle? Michael wants to know. What is that? Who's that? Mike Shoulders? He's an author from Tennessee. What, what do you call a lot of sheep standing in a circle? Hmm. Let's think. This is some pun. We should be able to get this. It's got to be some pun. Well, it's got to be on uh, circumference. Lamb. Uh, or it's got to be pun. you something. You think? Uh, or kid something. Hmm, he stumped or ram, us. Or ram something. Shepherd's pie. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. That's you got us good. Michael, whoever, wherever you are out there, Michael from... Foxville, Tennessee, you got us good. That's a really funny one. That's yeah. a good joke. We got to remember that. Because you know what? When you go to a math conference, you got to have all those geeky math jokes. They're so funny. <laughs> yeah. I love going to math. So I got to ask you a couple of questions, all right? Yeah, As, yeah. I'll ask you some writer questions. Okay. What's the craziest place you ever got a book idea? Oh, the craziest place like, I ever got a book idea. Oh, my goodness. I don't you know. know. I, I, I don't really have like a, well, I don't know. I'm out walking or I don't have a crazy place. Although, you know what? I was writing a book in uh, when we lived. Or a crazy event. Okay. I was a writing a book, event. Circumference and uh, the Isle of Imeter, the one I showed earlier. And uh, my, my husband was working in Lugano, Switzerland. So we had this beautiful apartment there um, overlooking Lake Lugano. And my whole job for that summer, because I just took the summer off to live there with them, uh, was to write this book. So I have this little table and I'm sitting there like a real author and I have this view of the lake. It's totally quiet. I can't think of a thing. I can't think of a thing. All summer long, I'm trying to write this book and I can't think of a thing. And we went to Florence and I'm walking around and I'm looking at different cathedrals and things. And I see like these tiles kind of going up around the sides of the cathedrals. And this is right before I'm gonna come back to the US and start teaching again. I'm thinking, oh, that's it. That's it. That's the idea that's going to start that book. But doggone it, I had to waste an entire summer sitting there tapping my fingers on a little table with a laptop thinking, yeah. why can't I think of a story? Because usually I think my best thoughts in water. I grew up as a competitive swimmer and my dad was in the Navy, so I was always near water. So I think really well in the shower and the swimming pool. Last year I swam 532 miles in the year. You know, I went almost every day wow. I was in the pool and that's where I look that's where I think of a lot of my books is when I'm swimming in the shower or out walking so if you see me out walking and I'm talking to myself I'm actually thinking about my books but these days that's not yeah. a big deal because everyone talks to themselves because they're on the phone but me I'm not on the phone I'm just yeah. talking to myself but 
Yeah. But you can pretend you're on the phone. Then they won't think you're nuts. I do. Well, they won't think you're a... because they will probably take me away. Yes. Otherwise. They won't think you're. <laughs> uh... All right. So, uh, well, that's wonderful. This was great. You know, you know what I think we should do? What? I think you should show all your book covers again for all those teachers out there. All right. Just, I'll, just hold I'll, them up. I'll, I'll do series by series. Is that okay? All right. Yeah. So here's Mummy Math. And then yeah, Mummy it? Math. Oh, a geometry book. Yep. Mm -hmm. And here's the second one called Patterns in Peru. Yep. And did you know that Pat was my Patterning. Dog? What's that? Um, this is my dog. Or was my dog. <laughs> Riley's in dog heaven now, but he was famous. He was in three books. And this is Pastry School in Paris. Pastry School in Paris, right? Okay, so those oh, are the, that's, that's, that's a capacity book. Yep. That's a capacity right. book. Which, you know what? If you live in the United States, you got to do cups and pints and quarts and blah, blah, blah. If you live in Europe, it's milliliters, liters, deciliters. Yeah. All on the yeah. text, but could we do that here? No, we couldn't do that here. No, we do tall, short, grande. Uh. <laughs> All right, so here's the scholastic books. This is Amanda Bean's Amazing Dream. This is a multiplication story. Yep. Now, Amanda Bean is a character you created. Oh, yeah. Of yeah, it's great. Made up, all made up, everybody. That was inspired by a class of third graders. They were gifted and talented. It was a special school I taught in. And we were learning our times tables. And guess what? All the girls didn't want to do that. I'm thinking, what is this? I said, I got to write something funny about a little girl who does not want to learn her times table. And this story is all about a little girl who resists a new strategy. She doesn't want to learn because thank you very much. She's real good at counting and adding. Why do I need to multiply? And she has this completely crazy dream because she likes to count things. And it goes by too quickly. So she decides, OK. I guess I should multiply. And then here's the book I talked about. 80 pounds of tomatoes. Yeah, Great. My dad, my dad in the gardening catalog. And this one. Chocolate champs. Great. Yeah, money. All right, so that's that. All right, now here comes the big list. The covers will be redesigned, but most of them are old now. Here's the first one. Yep, great cover. And then here's the new second one. Circumference and the Dragon of Pi. Beautiful. I love it. Here's the third one. There's a, famous, there's a famous restaurant in Boston called Radius. Oh, next time I'm there, I'm going to ask, is it got good food? Yes. Okay. It's one of those celebrity chef places. Oh, okay. So you have to save up your pennies before you go. <laughs> That's all right. Circumference in the great night of Angleland. Mm -hmm. wow. This is that's the fourth in the fourth grade math series when I go every year now and read to the fourth graders at my school because I'm the yeah. author. This was the fifth one. Isle of Emeter. Mm -hmm. This is the one where you're going to find the area of the circle, but it's got a little bit of calculus in it. We'll show you. It's very understandable, even to those of us who haven't done calculus too much. And really all it is is it's taking an orange slice and recreating yeah. it into a rectangle. And the more times you cut each orange segment, the smoother, yeah. straighter the rectangle becomes. And that's the very beginning idea or a very beginning idea in calculus. So for yeah. all those AP calculus teachers out there, this one's for you. Okay, yeah. and then after that one, I did one on place value for younger children. This is probably first and second grade. This is probably my youngest circumference book here. All the King's Tens. All the King's Tens, wow. They're having Great. a big party and they have to organize everybody so Lady Di knows how many meals they need. And so they have to figure out how they're gonna count each other. And they figure the most efficient way is groups of tens and then groups of yeah. hundreds and groups of thousands. It's a place value book. And then, yeah. um, oh, I forgot this one. This was a little bit before that one. This is um, three dimensional shapes. Wow. And Euler's. An Euler's formula. Circumference in the sword in the cone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. And then we've got, this is um, coordinate geometry, which kids use when they're really little. You know, they, you know, it's the finding the coordinates on a grid. But then this is wow. good for middle and high school when you're doing functions. It's the same thing. Wow. Wow. That's okay. great. 
This I've one, never seen that book either. This one's on graphing. And these two characters that you see in this book, the two bakers, B Pia and Bart, are the same yeah. as my new book. So they make a real. I see. Yep. This one is on rounding. Wow, circumference in the roundabout battle. What a great title. And the battle is one with bee skeps. And bee skeps are like medieval beehives. So I'd learn all about medieval beekeeping when I did that one. And then this one is circumference in the fraction fair. It's about fraction. Yeah. And then yeah, the newest yeah. one, so that's number 10. And then number 11 is the one that I read. So there we are. Hey, congratulations. You're my hero. Uh, I think how lucky the kids are to have a teacher like you. Okay, let me show you, before we go, let me show you um, my journal here. This is one of my writing journals. And inside there, I write down lots of stuff. Like, this is all about the Isle of Imeter when I was sketching out what the castle might look like and thinking about yeah. area and perimeter. So that's you writing, that's you writing the book. Um, yeah, these are my first notes. Yeah. What I do is I write yeah. in a journal first. And then after I do that, I go on the computer and I start. And you and write by hand. I do. Yeah. This is um, from Patterns in Peru. I had to create a sort of a poncho that was um, an ancient one that was patterned yeah. for the two kids to figure out what it meant. And then some, this is one of the, the sort of the Aztec, the Incan gods that I kind of made up. That's what I thought it might look like. Now it's not necessarily what happens when the illustrator gets a hold of it, but for me, I don't draw very well, but at least I can um, figure you out. You can give direction. Like, yeah. yeah, and then that helps me move the writing along. But I'll tell you, my third graders think I draw very well, but, but they say, Mrs. Neuschwander, you should draw your own pictures. And I say, uh, no, 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 I mean, no, yeah. no. But it's fun. I love doing it. I love writing. It's fun. And I love sharing math with kids in a way that maybe will yeah. help because I know I've lived I've lived the math life of, I don't get it and I hate it. I mean, I remember yeah. the moment, I can ask people at a conference, do you remember the moment you hated math? And they'll raise their hand, yes. And I'll tell you, mine was ninth grade geometry with Mr. Miller. That was the moment in my life I said, I hate this. And you shouldn't yeah. have that happen. And yeah. Mr. Miller was a great teacher, don't get me wrong, but he was not a great teacher for Cindy. Mm -mm. Yeah. Well, it is. Well, I'll tell you a math story. I. I was an average student in high school. I was an average student in college, you know, and uh, I ran into one of my teachers and I said, uh, by the way, I go, hey, hey, Mr. Blake, you're the only A I ever got in high school. And he says, uh, he taught geometry. Hmm. Okay? He so I, I go, you're the only A I ever got in high school. He looks at me and goes, are you talking about a quiz? <laughs> so I, thought that, I thought that was really funny. <laughs> and then I'll tell the kids a secret about me. I write children's books, but when I took my college boards, I scored really high in math and wow. very low in English. So there's a lot of people that can't believe that I write books, you know. But that's my, my whole point, my Jerry. Math, my math boards were like 600 something, and my English boards were like 430, something like that. You know? See, isn't, isn't that so the I was probably I was probably the least likely to write books in high school. But that's the uh -huh. message, Jerry. That's my message, too, is you don't know when you grow up what you're going to do. So make sure you are just taking in everything you can. Because I have some kids who say to me, this is Neuschwander. I'm never going to need this. And I'll say, oh, don't say that. I'm living proof. I'm living proof yeah. that you might. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We have got a couple more comments. Lin Lynette Richaud says, thank you so much for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, Linda Edwards says, thank you, Cindy, for sharing so many great books with us. And this has been a fun session. And I can't believe it's been an hour. You and I have talked here for an hour. Well, it's fine. You know what? We haven't, talked in, we haven't talked in a long time because I haven't seen yeah. you at conferences. Were you going to go to Chicago? Yeah, probably. Yeah. You know the, the one that was canceled at the beginning of April? That was their 100th centennial, their 100th meeting, and I was going to speak there. I was all ready yeah. to go, and then they canceled it. It's like, bummer. Yeah. So you know what? Next know. time, connect next time there's a conference. I don't go to that many anymore, but um, yeah. yeah. We have to connect more yeah. often, Jerry. Well, nice talking to you. I think last time we talked publishing, so this time we talked books. This is great.
Yeah, hey, fun. everybody. Uh, it's been an hour. Cynthia, you, Cindy, you've been terrific. You're a great guest. I can't thank you enough. And all my author buddies, I love them because they're so creative and they're so different. I think when I first started my career, I used to think I was in competition with all the other authors. Now I, I, we're, we're all so different and we all have such great creative stuff. Um, it's, it's just great to share it. It's, it's wonderful. But that's what makes up the library of the world is all those different people writing different things for different people. It's good. So thanks, yeah. everybody. Thanks very much. You're the much. first author I met with a shield. So <laughs> with yeah. armor, the first author I met with armor. Yeah, it's going to be tough to top that one, huh, Jerry? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everybody. Take thanks care. for the great days. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, family, for letting for lending you to us for an hour. That was good. All right. All right. Take care. Talk to you everybody soon. Take care.